chainsaw milling on location. That's what we're gonna look at in today's video. And let me just say, there's nothing like messing around in someone else's backyard, standing in the bushes, fighting with an old chainsaw and a beat up Alaskan mill, feeling your frustration levels rise to new heights. And you can be sure to expect many wonderful breakdowns and putting your best effort into not banging your head against a brick wall as you fiddle around with tiny objects on an empty stomach. Yes, such a wonderful experience indeed. But why put yourself through such misery and suffering you may ask? Well, if you know what to look for, there are treasures to be found my friends, and the chainsaw gods will reward you in beautiful wood. So let's jump into it. Now that is a small gate. <laughs> The trailer is not gonna make it. Sometimes you run into a tree or a log that's sitting where a crane truck can't come within reach to pick it up. And when a log is so nice that you can't pass on it, and if there's no way of moving it, then we need to bring the mill to the log. And that's when we bring out the old chainsaw and its trusty wingman, the Granberg Alaskan Mill. And spoiler alert, this did produce some absolutely stunning looking slabs. And I want to use this as a little case study, if you will, into how much this stuff is actually worth. So bear with me as I will briefly walk you through some key points when chainsaw milling, and then we'll look at just how much wood we got out of this birch and what an estimated value could be. <sighs> wow. Ooh. That is really cool. Oh, that's a nice little bugger right there. The work actually begins the night before. This is when I go through all my tools and gear that I bring with me. If you want a bit more detailed look at the actual tools and gear, I will put a link in the description to an older video of mine to talk more about tools and techniques. And you can check that out if you want to learn more. I want to have an early start and by doing the preparations the day before, I can quickly load the trailer first thing in the morning and be off as the sun rises. So the prep work is a big part of chainsaw milling. This log was fairly uniform in size for about the first four meters and then it tapers off. And you rarely have use for slabs longer than that anyway. So I just began by bucking it to length, cutting the offcut into smaller chunks and getting all that out of the way. I also trim the top side of the log from any small branches or bumps that might get in the way. I'm gonna have to cut a ledge here for a, to make a flat spot to mount the end bracket. When it comes time to attach the end brackets, they are the ones that allow me to clamp a ladder on top of this log. I do take some care in their positioning you want the cut to start and end at the roughly same distance from the center of the log, which is called the pith. This might not be the actual center of its diameter, but rather the center of the growth rings. If you get this right, then this ensures that the grain runs uniform through each slab. I sincerely apologize for all the noise. There's horrible wind and now there's a chopper flying here. Anyway, the guide rail is on, which is really just a ladder. This time I made a poor example of myself as I forgot to tighten one of the set screws on the end brackets that hold the ladder. And this made the ladder tilt over to one side and the chainsaw just got bent inside the curve. And I was in full Neanderthal mode right here and did not stop to check even though I could tell it was not cutting right. I do tend to make poor decisions when I'm hungry and this was approaching lunchtime. So oh, there's that. see the mess I made oh boy all this time I was cutting and I was thinking it was the chain that was you know incorrectly sharpened or something oh boy oh we can see this big curve here uh. <laughs> 
since the chainsaw bar was messed up, I switched to my other bar and set the mill to cut my first slab. But I didn't get very far because the needle bearing for the sprocket exploded. Today is not going very well. You can see, we snapped a chain. Or maybe it just came off. I don't know. We'll see. That's the end of my day. There is really nothing I can do about that. I don't have parts for this. sucks. The needle bearings took a week to arrive as it had to be shipped from Germany and whenever I need to order new spare parts I always order two of the same thing so I can put one of them on my saw and the other one goes in my toolkit. So again preparations are all made the night before making sure I can hit the ground running as they say when I arrive the next day. And I'm sure we are going to have a wonderful day sawmilling with uh, no outside influence to make life difficult. Oh, a snowstorm. How lovely. Let's try and stay positive. Oh look, deer on the road. Once the first cut has been made and your equipment isn't falling apart, cutting the slabs is the easy part. You just sit there, feeding the saw through the log, and each slab you cut, there's always some excitement in getting a look at the character of the wood, as each slab will be unique. And this is not Master Birch or Karelian Birch. This is uh, something different. This is just your plain, normal birch, but it has a lot of pearls. And this is typical birch uh, burl. This has been used uh, throughout all the uh, history in uh, northern Sweden and Lapland uh, for making these kuxa bowls that you drink your coffee from or whatever you used to drink back then. So yeah, really interesting stuff. Can't wait to continue cutting. Oh yeah, and one final thing. If you remember last time, the first cut we made, the, the surface we established was really, really wonky. And it's not the end of the world. Uh, if you're able to hold the mill very nice and flat as you're cutting cutting the, your, your next uh, slab here, if the bar is nice and straight, it will be able to straighten out the, uh, the mess that, that was uh, created. So let's get to the burning question of this video, and that is how much would something like this be worth? And here is where it gets really crazy. And I'll try and talk as fast as I possibly can because there is a lot to go through for us to get a complete picture. First, we need to know our volume. The log itself was a little bit over 2.5 cubic meters in volume. The actual yield, however, was 1.33 cubic meters of slabs, which is 563 board feet. I cut the slabs to 80 millimeters or just over 3 inches in thickness, which would be called 12 quarter because it is 12 quarters of an inch in thickness. If we look at pricing for kiln dried dimensional lumber, we can see that birch is around $6 per board foot, but I could only find plain four quarter birch with a maximum length of 10 feet. If you know how lumber is priced, then you also know that thicker wood in particular is more expensive. This is because it takes longer to dry. Anyway, since I didn't find any pricing for 12 quarter birch, I then looked at similarly priced species that was also available in 12 quarter. Cherry was listed at $8.90 per board foot. So if we take our 563 board feet of yield and multiply that by $8.90, we get a whopping $5,010. But that is not an apples to apples comparison. The figured stuff sell for $11 per board foot. So that stuff is priced even higher, making our total haul be worth $6,193. So that's a fair bit of money. The other aspect of this is that slabs, believe it or not, can be priced twice that much. And top producers do charge a lot of money for their slabs. And there are reasons for that.
Generally, it costs more in production to produce slabs. One obvious reason is that they are heavy and difficult to handle. They take a lot of space inside of kilns because of their irregular shape compared to dimensional lumber, which can be stacked very precisely to make the most out of the space inside a kiln. And since it costs money to run a kiln, especially 12 quarter, which needs to stay in there for way longer than 4 quarter, having empty space inside a kiln is going to add to the cost of the material. The kiln operating costs can be spread out to a larger number of boards if all of the space inside the kiln was used to its full potential. Dimensional lumber cuts way faster on sawmills because you are not cutting through the bark every time. You always have the same width of cut so you can fine tune your cutting speeds which cuts down on production costs etc etc. So the takeaway is that everything with slabs tend to be more difficult. If we look at a top producer such as GL Veneer I took a look at their inventory and it seems that most of their slabs are priced at around $35 per board foot on a variety of species. And my dog is going crazy in the background here so I'm sorry about the noise. But if we then multiply that by our yield of 563 board feet then we get a massive $19,705. Some of you may fringe at those numbers because you know that it is very feasible to do this on a small scale and as long as you don't mind a few days of back pain and sore muscles and you know I'm still fairly young and healthy. I did turn 34 the other week and I now have beard growing out of my nose and yeah that made me feel a little bit weird but I still don't mind doing this type of work. Anyway what we now know is that this wood haul that I have right here is worth at a minimum $5,010. So then why do the top producers charge seven or eight times that amount? The amount of money that it costs to run a business once you're in the big league is huge. You need marketing, customer service, maintenance, accountants, you need to pay salaries to the employees working there, and also you have costs for external services that you don't need employees for. Then there's the cost of raw materials, tooling, machinery, equipment, heck even the coffee machine costs money to maintain. You've got utility costs and rent for the buildings, and lastly there needs to be a profit margin so that the company can continue to grow and invest in either better equipment or hire more people. Slabs are still a niche product and what if a slab doesn't sell for a year or two? You still have your fixed cost every month and if the product doesn't sell, once it passes the break even point in terms of costs accumulated over that period of time, then it will sell for a loss, despite having been sold for a crazy amount of money. And that's just how business works. But when you have a small business and you try and upscale, the equipment you need to get from small scale to medium or large scale, that leap is huge. We are talking hundreds of thousands of dollars. You most likely need to hire people in order to keep up with the demand you've created and nobody is going to want to work for you if they need to wrestle a 600 pound piece of wood all day. So does $4,000 for a slab sound crazy to you? 